Well, happy, holy, and blessed Sabbath. It's good to see all your smiling faces here this morning. It's good to be here. It's my first time actually coming physically to Anderson Church. Can you believe that? And, uh, you know, I just told Pastor, hey, just tell me when you want me to come, and I'll come. But uh, thank you, Pastor Yabot. Uh, as, as he mentioned, uh, I am part Filipino. I always call him for, for all you Filipino speakers out there, I call myself an itlar. And you know what that means. It means an egg. And I call myself an egg because I'm white on the outside, but golden in the middle because I'm Asian in the middle. <laughs> so that's what I say. And, uh, you know, I, yes, we got married a couple years ago, and um, it's, uh, it's good being here. Thank you for, for inviting me, and um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So without further ado, let's start off with a word of prayer, another word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for all that you do for us day by day, and uh, we have so much to be grateful for continually, and um, Father, we just pray that you will be with your word today, and that you will bring it alive, and that you will give uh, me a living testimony, not because of what's good in me, but what's because of what's good in you. And uh, we pray that you'll bless every individual here in your own special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As uh, Pastor mentioned, I am Risk Management Director and Associate Treasurer. But there was a time when I was nothing but a risk. And some of you might know what I'm talking about. And I'd be the last person you'd probably want handling your money. And... Uh, the first time, I, usually when I come to speak at a church for the first time, what I talk about kind of is my testimony. And I love giving my testimony. Uh, but I also intertwine the message with that testimony. And the message, of course, today is named, Why Sanctify Thyself? Why Sanctify Thyself? And so, as a child, I was pretty good. You know, I made decent grades. I was kind of a teacher's pet, probably. But then you get to a certain point when around your adolescent hood, things start to turn. And I don't know if, I don't, you know, maybe none of y'all have been through that time of your life where you're a teenager and uh, you just start doing your own thing. And it, how well did that work for you? Did that work pretty well? No, probably not. And it certainly didn't work well for me. So, um, you know, I did not grow up an Adventist. I grew up in the world. Uh, uh, it's a long story, but my parents were, were divorced when I was two. My dad was a very quiet guy. He was a very analytical-minded, but my mom was a party girl. She's wild, and she, she, is, uh, she loves her motorcycles today, even still. So, you know, I grew up with this kind of dynamic, not a dynamic that you would say would be ideal, but... Um, when I got to high school, about that time, that's when I started doing my own thing. And it didn't, like I said before, it didn't really work for me. And I, you know, how it usually goes is you're around somebody who is a bad influence, and then you start doing things that you never would have before, and then it just gets worse and worse from there. That's exactly what happened to me. It started probably with cigarettes. And then, you know, I'm, I'm going over this to kind of tell you where I was at to give you a contrast of where, where God has taken me. But, you know, it started out with cigarettes, and then it moves on to harder stuff where I was doing drugs. And by the time of my senior year, can you guess what my GPA was in high school? Anybody want to take a guess? A two go down. Okay, not a zero. I actually did do some things. But it was pretty close. <clears throat> My GPA was a 1.2 GPA. You know, if you're in the Philippines, that's actually a really good GPA, but not here. <laughs> it's the opposite in the Philippines, what I learned anyway. So that kind of tells you what kind of per or student I was in high school, right? And I ended up dropping out with that GPA right there. And I was the type that couldn't even hold a job at McDonald's. Now, McDonald's is supposed to be where no matter how bad you are, you're supposed to be able to be able to work at McDonald's, right? Um, I couldn't even hold a job there. I was totally out of control. And like I said, I was nothing but a risk. And I was just very, very, uh, I was just a mess. 
Just a mess with a capital M. And maybe some of you have been in that type of situation before. Or maybe you all grew up a uh, perfect child, never did anything wrong. Or maybe some of you could kind of relate to where I'm coming from. Kind of felt like everything I did just fell apart in my hands. It felt like no matter what I tried to do, it would just, I would just ruin it. How many have ever felt like that before? How many people have been there in your lives? I see some hands being raised. So you know what it's like to just feel like a mess. And, and, and it doesn't matter where you go, what you try to do, no matter what you do, things just fall apart in your hands. And that's not a good feeling, is it? That wouldn't be a good feeling to have. But I realized that when I was during, going during that whole time and phase of my life, I was searching for something. And I was searching for what the ultimate purpose in life. Now remember, I did not grow up Adventist. I, didn't, I barely had any Christian influence. So here I was kind of left to see without a compass or a map of anything really. I was just out there trying to do my own thing. And because I couldn't figure out what my ultimate purpose, what my ultimate uh, just calling in life was, I did what I wanted by default. And, um, you know, usually during those types of years, all you want to do is pretty much party. And uh, that's what I did, just party and get into a lot of trouble. But I ended up finding myself in some really deep darkness. I don't know if anybody has been in that place before where you just feel like you are, uh, you're just in darkness. You are lost. You don't know where to go, what to do. And it's, it's a pretty, it almost feels like you're in a hopeless situation. Almost feels like you're in a hopeless situation. I suffered from paranoia. I don't know if anybody has suffered from paranoia here. That's not, not just worry. That's you are actually kind of thinking that everybody is out to get you. And, I, and being on drugs, I remember sometimes I would get so scared that I felt like it was the end of the world. And I felt like, what it felt like to me was being, the best way I can describe it is you are lost, it's the end of the world, and there's nothing you can do about it. And I can tell you there is no feeling that is worse than that feeling. And I believe, I believe what God did is he gave me a taste of what it's going to taste like when the lost finally realize that they are permanently lost and there is absolutely nothing they can do. I believe God gave me a taste of that. And it really scared me. It really scared me. But I'm glad he did that because it helped to try to wake me up from my slumber of sin. And so here I was in this lost condition, in this uh, just messed up condition. But evidently, some, something happened along the way. And uh, that thing was a girlfriend. I can tell you that's, that's, <laughs> that's what kind of turned things around there. So I got, in, I got involved with this girl. She wasn't my girlfriend to begin with, but she helped me out. And I ended up living with her grandparents. But I, 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 when I saw how much she cared about me, it actually, it actually touched my heart. And it melted my heart. And uh, we ended up becoming girlfriend and boyfriend. But... Guess what happened? That didn't last too long. And she ended up breaking it with me. Now, when you're about probably in your 20s, I think it was early 20s, or in your teenhood, when somebody breaks up with you, that feels like the end of the world, right? And it's anything but, but that's what it felt like to me. It was like the most horrible, one of the most horrible feelings. It broke my heart. And she wouldn't even tell me what's wrong, but I, 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 I guess it was just because I was a mess. That's probably why I don't blame her now for breaking up with me. But it felt like just this, the worst thing in the world, right? It feels like your life is over. And I was so miserable, I was so depressed, that when I went to work, all, I, I, I couldn't even smile. I don't know if anybody's been through depression before, where all you can do is just, uh, well, at work, what I was doing is I was cussing my coworkers out so that, you know, because I was just so miserable. I was just so miserable. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in a place like that before, or maybe in it now, but I was, I was utterly miserable. But 
This was probably one of the best things that could have happened for me. During this time, I started having some suicidal thoughts. Started having some suicidal thoughts. I started thinking, what's the point when all I do is just mess stuff up? What's the whole point of me even being alive when all I do is just break things? My, my relationships with my family, when I break, you know, I couldn't even barely hold a job. I didn't have a car. I was depending on other people. I was just in a very bad spot and just felt like no matter what I did, I couldn't get out of it. So I was like, why? Why am I even here? And I became a little bit, started thinking a little suicidal thoughts. Like maybe it's better if I'm not here. Maybe then I'll be at peace or something. That's what I started thinking. But you know, it's in your darkest hour that what happens? The light shines the brightest, right? The light shines the brightest. There was a place I could always go, no matter how uh, anxious I was, no matter how un at, at disrest, I don't even know what the right, distress, there we go, how much distress I was in, there was a place that could always give me a little bit of peace. And can you go guess where that was? That was in God's word. That was in the Bible. I didn't call it God's word at that point. But I went to the Bible and it had this strange power to it that when I started just reading it, it would just kind of calm me down. I don't know if anybody had felt that before kind of calmed me down. And it was really the only thing that could really bring me peace during that time was just reading the Bible. So I figured, and I came to the conclusion, you know, maybe I can't do life by myself. Maybe I'm so messed up and my life is so messed up because I've been trying to do things my way this whole time and it certainly hasn't worked for me. So I started reading the Bible and I became really convicted when I, when I was reading through Proverbs, I was reading through Psalms, and it, it, you know how it describes the contrast between the wicked and the righteous and the wise and the foolish? I tell you, when I was reading the description of the, the wicked and the foolish, it's like I was looking at my life, basically. And it convicted me so much that I was like, you know what? I think your word is true. I think your word is true. And what I did at that point was I acknowledged how messed up I was. I acknowledged that. And then I accepted Christ as my savior. I said, God, I've tried it my own way. I've only, all I've been able to do is just mess stuff up. So I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to give my life to you. And I didn't know much about the Bible during this time, but I tell you, when you, it doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible, when you give your life to Christ, when you surrender, and when you surrender everything to Jesus, because he wants it all, he'll give you the peace that you're longing for. He will give you the, he'll give you the, the, the inward peace, he'll give you, and that's what he started giving to me. It's like a flood of light came into my life. It's like a flood of peace. It's stuff that I, things that I haven't even felt before, things that I had lost. I finally felt like I had made it to the winning team. And uh, best of all, God gave me purpose. God gave me purpose, and he gave me, uh, he gave me a good conscience. And I tell you, if you don't have a good conscience, I don't care what you got, you don't have anything. But that's what God was given to me. I didn't know anything about the Bible. And at that point, I was justified. I was justified. And we were talking about justification and sanctification in Sabbath school this morning. And I was thinking, boy, this is a pre premeditator to what my sermon's going to be about. So I was justified. How much did I know about the Bible? Did I keep the Sabbath? Did I? Nothing was changed about my life except that I had given my life to Christ. That's the only thing that I had done. And God, what he did is he changed me from the inside. I had my ticket to heaven at this point. I was like that thief on the cross. How much did the thief do to, to merit Jesus telling him, today you will be with me in paradise? What did, what did the thief do? What could the thief, could he get baptized? He couldn't do a thing. He couldn't do a thing. I felt like I was 
finally given new life. And I can't tell you how wonderful that feeling is. And if you've never experienced that, if you've never experienced the, the, the joy of salvation, is what I call it, then maybe we need to consider whether we have surrendered to Christ fully or not. Romans 3.24 says it this way, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says it this way, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, is there anything that we can do to merit eternal salvation? Is there any amount of works that we can do to be justified? There's absolutely nothing we can do to work our way into, into salvation, right? That's what the Bible says. Can't do this by our own works. There's no amount of Bible studies or sermons that we can give that'll merit, merit us brownie points enough to merit eternal salvation, right? We can't be nice enough. Some people act like, oh, if I'm not giving stuff away, I'm not going to be a good enough person to make it into heaven. And you know they, what they say about men, what's the way to our hearts? It's through our stomachs, right? Well, it doesn't really work that way with God. It doesn't matter how good you cook, you can't cook your way into heaven, right? We, there's no dietary guidelines that's going to merit us eternal salvation, right? Right? Justification is wholly dependent on the merits of Christ. Wholly dependent on the merits of Christ. And it's faith in Christ's sacrifice alone in yielding to Christ that will merit us to have justification. So that's justification. Psalm chapter 77, verse 13 says, Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And who is Jesus? What did Jesus say about himself? I am the way, right? So Jesus is in the sanctuary. And what we know as good Adventists is that the, the sanctuary is a, is, a, is a kind of a miniature of God's plan of salvation, right? So as we look at the sanctuary service, we can tell and understand more of God's plan of salvation. And where is the first stop as we go through the sanctuary service? Where's the first stop? We have the altar of sacrifice, right? We have the altar of sacrifice. What is that? Well, first of all, we know that Jesus sacrificed himself, right? But what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as far as practical wise? Romans 12 verse one tells us what? I beseech thee therefore brethren, by the mercies of God that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, partially? Did he say partially? No, he says holy, holy unto God. So how much does God want? He wants all of it, right? If you can think about it, God wants it. If you can think about it, God wants it. No matter what it is, God wants you to put it on the altar. It doesn't mean he's necessarily going to take it away, but you must be at least willing for him to take it away, if that makes sense. Sister Wise says it this way, in the faith I live by on page 111, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. When... Men see their own nothingness. They are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So the first stop tells us that we first must acknowledge that we are a mess, that we are sinful, that, we are, that even our, our best motives are tainted by sin. Everything about us is unclean. All of our righteousness, did he say some of our righteousness is as filthy rags? No. All of our righteousness is, is as filthy rags. So the first step is for us to acknowledge that. And, uh, you know, I mentioned there's only, there is nothing for us to do to merit justification, but that's only a partial truth, and here's why. Why is that a partial truth? 
Because why doesn't God just save everybody, right? Why doesn't God just save everybody? Let's take Nicodemus, for example. Jesus told Nicodemus, and remember who Nicodemus was, right? We all remember him. He was esteemed as his high teacher in Israel. He was uh, looked at as like the cream of the crock, but what did Jesus say? He said that unless you be born again, you're not going to enter into heaven. So here you, here you have Nicodemus. Imagine this, he probably grew up in an Adventist home, went to the best Adventist schools, became an Adventist teacher, not just an Adventist teacher, but one of the best. And he became, he was probably a very good citizen. By all outward appearance, Nicodemus looked like he was it. But Jesus said, look, none of that matters. All that matters is that you be born again by breaking yourself upon the rock of Christ, by accepting my sacrifice, accepting me, and yielding yourself wholly to God. So we know that justification happens through faith, right? It happens through us sacrificing our lives upon that altar. It, ex it happens by us accepting Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. That's how justification happens. That's how we're saved. It's nothing we can do to earn salvation except yield ourselves wholly to God. That's the only thing that we can do, right? But does the journey stop there? Does the journey stop there? Does the journey through the sanctuary stop at the altar of sacrifice? No, it keeps going on, right? So what's, as we go past the altar of sacrifice, we go through the labor of washing. So as we yield ourselves, as we sacrifice ourselves to God, he washes us from our sins, right? It's exactly what he did to me. But then, and only then, are we prepared to enter where? To the most, or the holy place, right? to the holy place. And what's inside the holy place? What's inside the holy place? You have the table of showbread, you have the altar of incense, and you have the candlestick, right? Again, I'm reading from Sister White's writings, Review and Herald, October 5th, 1886, where she says, the faith in Christ, which saves the soul, is not what is represented to be by many. Believe, believe is their cry. Only believe in Christ and you will be saved. It is all you have to do. While truth, faith, trust wholly in Christ for salvation, it will lead to perfect conformity to the law of God. Faith is manifested by what? By works, right? Faith is manifested by works. So we talked about justification, but there's a process that starts when we're born again. And what's that process? Sanctification, right? Sanctification. And sanctification is pictured in the holy place. And, and what does the table of showbread represent? What does that represent? As, right, exactly. We are to feast upon Jesus. We are to feast upon his word. We're supposed to feast upon Christ. And what happens as we feast upon him? He becomes a part of us, right? He becomes a part of us. The altar of incense. What does incense represent in scripture? Prayer, Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, I think. Uh, somewhere in chapter 8 of Revelation, it says that the incense is the prayers of the saints, right? How often were, was the incense supposed to go up? Pretty consistently, right? And the candlestick, what does that represent? Matthew chapter 5 comes to mind. Matthew chapter 5 tells us, let... Your light so shine before men that what? They may see your good works, that you may glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So how often were the daily, well, I just said it, how often were the services done in the holy place? It's a daily thing, right? So daily, we're supposed to be feasting upon God's word. Daily, we're supposed to be praying. And not just, here's the thing, we think of prayer, some of us, we think of prayer as, you know, and most of the time it's, okay, we say a little prayer before bed, and maybe we'll say a little prayer when we get up. But really, prayer is called the breath of the soul, right? How often 
How long can you go without breathing? Can't go very long, can you? How long can you go without eating? You, you can go a lot longer, right? But you cannot go that long without breathing. So we have to be in a constant state of prayer. However, prayer in the morning is the most important thing, I think, as far as prayer is concerned. And the reason is you have a whole day ahead of you where you're going to be, you're going to be dealing with all sorts of different situations. But unless we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to meet those situations, it's how well is God going to be able to work in our lives? So we have to spend that quality time with the Lord in the morning time, especially wrestling with God every day. And then letting our light shine, that's our works. That's our works. And I think what happens sometimes, I think what happens sometimes is we, we skip the altar of sacrifice. We skip the altar of sacrifice and we try to go straight into the holy place where we have the Bible study, we have the prayer, and we have the working for God, but we have skipped that most important part. And we wonder why our prayers, our Bible study life, our, our evangelistic life is really not that potent. Why we get bored with it? Well, have we missed the altar of sacrifice? Have we truly yielded everything to the Lord? Have we truly yielded everything to the Lord? Going back to our scripture, John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But here's my question. You know, we look at this scripture a lot, verse 17. But the one I like to point out is verse 19. Verse 19. Verse 19 tells us why Jesus sanctified himself. And what does verse 19 says? It says, and for th whose sakes? Is it his own sake? No, it's for their sakes. I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So why did Jesus sanctify himself? Was it for himself? It was for others. So the whole point of doing what God wants us to do is not to be saved, right? Because we already went over that there is no amount of works that can save us. That's justification. And I think sometimes what we do is we blend justification and sanctification. But sanctification is the process whereby when God sheds light in your way, you absorb that light and you live by that light. So when God says to go, you go. When God says to stop, you stop. When God says to eat a certain way, you eat that way. And we're not doing it for eternal salvation. We're doing it for the sake of others. And I think if we can grasp that concept right there, that would put to rest a lot of confusion, I think, that's in the church nowadays. From my, at least from my limited perspective, I think why we have so much conflict as a church is because we don't really understand justification and sanctification, the processes and the purposes. The reason we do stuff is not to be saved. The reason we do stuff is that we can be better witnesses to save others. That's why we do stuff. And that's why we do what God tells us. We as a church have a health message. Why do we obey the health message? Is it to be saved? No, we don't obey the health message to be saved. I obey the health message because I know if I do that, I will A, have more energy, I will have a clearer mindset, and I will better be able to serve him in this life and longer serve him. Because if we disregard his health message, guess what? We are taking life away that God has given to us. And we're not able to serve him as well and as long as if we could have if we would have just obeyed his messages, right? That's why we do what God tells us to do. That's why we live how God wants us to live. That's why we, we do the things that please him, because we love him and we want to be lights to those around us. And if we're not living up to the light that God has given to us, guess what we are? We're false lights and we're leading people astray. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, but of a lifetime. 
It is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly dying to sin and constantly living for Christ. Wrongs cannot be righted nor reformations wrought in the character by feeble, intermittent efforts. It is only by long, persevering efforts, sore discipline, and stern conflict that we shall overcome. We know not one day how strong will be our conflict the next. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully obtained. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. Acts of the Apostles, page 560. Of course, we need Christ's merits to do anything. We need Christ's merits to do anything. If we haven't surrendered our life upon the altar, what we try to do is not going to work out too well for God. What we try to do is not going to work out too well for God. And remember, God does for us that which we cannot do for ourselves, right? And the illustration I like to use is, uh, like, let's say we're hungry. God wants us to eat, right? God wants us to sustain ourselves through food, obviously. We have peanut butter and jelly and bread in the closet. It is God's will for me to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, therefore he will provide that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If you sit at the table and wait for that peanut butter and jelly sandwich to arrive, guess what's going to happen? It's never going to arrive. So we have the power to get up and make that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. God is not going to do that for us. However, if because we have obeyed him, or if we obey him and because of this we lose our job and are not able to buy peanut butter and jelly or bread, God then comes in and says, hey, you have been faithful to me in the least, now I'm going to provide for you. And he might just give you that peanut butter and jelly sandwich at that point. That's how it works with God, right? That's how it works with God. When we look at the message of Laodicea, you know, we hear about it a lot. My thought of Laodicea is, is, is this. Laodicea, the attitude of Laodicea is that whatever God wants, he'll do in my life. I don't have any, you know, we're not saved by works. So what's the point of me even trying to do anything, right? I believe in Christ. And whatever God's going to do, he's going to do it. Instead of taking the initiative to learn God's will and apply it to our own lives. To me, that's kind of, it's this nonchalant attitude. And many times through scripture, God tells us to sanctify ourselves. Leviticus 11.44 says, For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and do them. And then he says this. He says, I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So who's the one that does the sanctifying? It's both. It's both. It's a joint effort. It's a joint effort. So over and over, God tells us, sanctify yourselves. Number 11, Numbers 11, verse 18, Joshua 3, 5, 1 Samuel 16, 5, 2 Chronicles 29, 5. Lots of examples where God says, sanctify yourselves. Sanctify yourselves. Take the initiative to do what I have told you to do. And if you are born again, you will want to do what God wants you to do, ultimately. Now, sometimes our flesh comes up and battles against what God wants us to do, but it's, it's up to us to put that to death. And if we are truly born again, we will put that to death eventually. You, never, you notice that uh, God never said, if you want to do this, do this. If you have children, do you ever tell your child, if you want to, clean your room? Why do you never tell your children that? Is that because they're being legalistic? Because if you, if you tell them that, what's going to happen? It's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. God didn't ask, are you wanting to do this? What he does ask is, are you willing to be made willing 
to do what I want you to do. That's what God asks. And if we have surrendered our life to Christ, that answer will be a definite yes. It will be a definite yes. Because faith works. Galatians 5, verse 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision and circumcision, but faith which worketh by what? By love. Faith works by love. So if we are making excuses not to live in the light that God has shined on our pathway, it's more of it's a heart problem is what it is. You know, a lot of people go after the leaves. They're like, oh, why aren't you doing this, this? You know, you can go after the leaves all you want, but really it's a heart issue. And it's a heart issue that says, I know better than Christ. I've got this. But God wants us to yield everything to him. He wants us to yield everything to him. So I don't really believe in long sermons. I know in the Philippines they can go pretty long sometimes. Or I don't know, a lot of, a lot of folks like to go long. Because I think of our minds as like a stomach, right? And if we eat too much, what happens? We get sleepy and we get full and we, we stop wanting more food. So I don't really believe in long sermons. But however, my call is this. This is my call. Will you travel with Jesus through the sanctuary? Will you travel with Jesus through the sanctuary? And where do I mean by that? Remember, the first stop was where? The altar of sacrifice. Are you willing to put everything upon that altar? Everything upon it. And I do mean everything. It doesn't matter what it is. All your heart. God wants all of our heart upon that altar, right? It could be a job. Some of, some of us might be working a job that God never intended us to work. If you took that job on Sabbath because you thought you wouldn't be able to provide or to make ends meet, God never wanted you in that job. I can tell you that with all clarity. And I know some people who do that. Or maybe it was a job that God gave you originally, but we, for some reason or another, it has taken too much of our focus. And now God is saying, you know what? You need to cut this thing off. Are you willing to give up everything? Might be relationship. Some of us might have toxic relationships that are in. I'm not just talking about girlfriend, boyfriend. Could be relationships with family. Sometimes our family can be our worst enemies. And some of us I know probably uh, know all about that. Sometimes our families can be so toxic and negative that we really need to cut them off. I mean, you know, be nice to them, obviously. You know, be, a, be Christian towards them. But at the same time, put up your boundaries. You, sometimes we have to put up boundaries. And it might be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. If that person is not helping your walk with Christ, guess what? Probably God doesn't want you to keep up with that relationship. I don't know, I don't know where you are in life, but it might be where you live. Maybe God wants you to move somewhere else. What about our money? God, does God want us to put our money on the altar? Of course he does. Maybe we are holding back from God because we are scared of him not providing for us. My mindset when it comes to giving for God is this. You know, a lot of people say, if I give to God what I have heard asked of me, I won't, how am I going to provide? That's not what I ask. What I ask is, if I don't give to God what he requires of me, how am I going to provide? That's the real question that we need to be asking. It might be our opinions. I think sometimes our opinions are going to keep us out of heaven because we're so opinionated about things, and it's really pride. Are we willing to relinquish our opinions upon the altar? Maybe it's our politics. If we're fighting about politics, that's uh, Sister White calls that, uh, what, how does she refer to that? Um, something about hagg haggling over a small sum to lose out in a bigger one, if you know what I mean. Could be our time. Maybe there's certain things that God wants to yield for us to yield with our time. What about our clothes? I won't talk much about that one. 
Maybe it's our emotions. Maybe some of us feel justified in retaining bitterness, anger, because so-and-so did such-and-such to me. Well, think about what they did to Christ. Did he retain bitterness? If anybody had any excuse to be bitter against somebody, it was Christ. Far more than we do. It's our temperament. Maybe it's our diet. None of us would have problems with diet in here, would we? Maybe it's our mouth. Maybe the words that, that come out of our mouth sometimes, we don't give it to God first. We don't filter it through the Lord and say, hey, Lord, is this okay for me to say? And we just say it, and guess what happens? Good stuff? Not usually. <laughs> and once you surrender all upon the, the altar, will you daily feast upon God's word, wrestle with God in prayer day by day, let your light shine in good works. And will you follow Jesus to the holiest of all, where glorification is the only place that that can happen? It's the only place that that can happen. Father in heaven, Lord, we are grateful that the path has been paved for us. And we can see that path through your sanctuary. And Lord, we pray... I, I hope and pray that it's our prayer that we are willing to give up everything to you upon that altar, no matter what it may be, no matter if it's jobs, relationships, money, our attitude, our clothes, our diet, whatever, Lord, it might be. I pray, Lord, that we will all be willing to put it upon that altar. And as we yield ourselves a living sacrifice to you, that your Holy Spirit will consume our offering and that we will be flames and fires of ministers uh, spreading your word, your light, and uh, doing good works in this world, not for our own sake and salvation merely, but for the salvation of others. Give us your love. May your love be the ever-abiding principle that enacts us. And I pray that each individual here will be blessed as they go whichever way they're going today, and that uh, this Sabbath will be a good Sabbath as we continue to rest in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To reach a friend with the Christ-centered message of hope and wholeness. This has been Anderson SDA Church in Northern California. Thank you for joining us. For more information, visit our website at andersonadventist.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.